Hey everyone, it's James Lindsay. Welcome back to the New Discourses Podcast. If you've been listening in serial, you know we've done a few hard episodes in a row now. So let's do something a little easier for a few. Um, what I want to give you today is a message, a very simple message. In fact, it's going to mirror an essay that by the time this is out, it will have been published on New Discourses and hopefully made some rounds bearing the title Three Terms communists redefined to subvert society. And so, as you know, the way that the kind of woke Marxist agenda proceeds is by redefining words, or one of the ways, one of the most important forms of its activism. And as a matter of fact, what I want to make a case for you uh, in this episode, and then I'll give you these three terms and discuss them along with a couple of others, um, but focusing on these three terms and how they build on one another, uh, which are inclusion, democracy, and citizenship, by the way. Uh, what I want to give you is a general principle of what critique actually is. And to understand when they say critical theory, the thing at the heart of that is critique, or we go back to Marx and he says that critique of religion is the beginning of his entire program, for example, in his critique of Hegel's philosophy of the right that he wrote in 1844. This critique I want to make the case is a very specific meaning. Now, we could go read from Alison Bailey. I've done that. In fact, I did a New Discourses bullet episode on that. It's all over the place in my writings. I've quoted it not just at length, but in full, multiple pages out of the journal Hypatia, where she explains the difference between critical thinking, which is based on epistemic adequacy, she says, soundness, validity of argument, and so on, evidentiary basis. It's about understanding what's true. And then she compares that to critical theory, which is something that arises from neo-Marxism, she says, and the Frankfurt School, and is actually about um, interrogating power dynamics and power structures. And so critical theory or critical Marxism is based off of the critique of this sort. And I want to give a general picture of what critique is, okay? And I will probably refer throughout this, if you're not keeping up with my kind of evolving terminology, to a phenomenon that I refer to as the dialectical left. The dialectical left is the enemy. Whether we want to point at neo-Marxists in the 1960s or critical Marxists, as they were also called cultural Marxists in the 1920s and 30s, if we want to see critical Marxists as a kind of cultural Marxist, if we want to look at identity politics through a Marxist framing, which I call identity Marxism in the kind of the 90s, or we want to look at the woke Marxism of today, or we want to look at straight up Marxism, or we want to look at, in fact, Hegel's philosophy, which I've discussed at length, I think that the common thing that binds them all is leftism done from a dialectical uh, framing. Now, Hegel himself probably was not necessarily a leftist, um, but he certainly is the father of the dialectic. And as such, his philosophy really is integral to what I call dialectical leftism, his f- philosophy of the transformation of society. And what that really represents is a podcast for another day um, with bringing the, the theoretical and practical ideas closer together with a th- theoretical idea being an approximation of the absolute idea. Maybe one of these days I'll actually suck it up and go complete math nerd on you and do the podcast where I discuss that I think all of dialectical leftism is, in fact, a gigantic f- attempt at approximating a four-year series of, uh, of of the ideal society of the Platonic Republic. But that's a podcast for another day and another time. We won't get into that. But the dialectical left, and we could even include Rousseau, who was very dialectical, although he didn't have the uh, philosophical machinery to do that in this kind of picture of what the dialectical left is. And if you don't know, for example, the dialectic was named as it is by, uh, or is understood kind of in its current incarnation, um, not because of Hegel, but actually because Hegel derived it from Kant, Immanuel Kant. And Immanuel Kant actually had a portrait hanging. He had one portrait hanging in his study, and that portrait was of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And Rousseau was the one who was attempting to figure out how to do a dialectical combination of opposites to rejoin man to his primitive 
instinctual nature. Civilized man had to meet his primitive nature, so what you have to have are savages made to live in cities. This was the basis for the concept of the dialectic that Kant kind of plucked out of kind of older philosophy, whether we're talking about Socrates or whatever, codified into the idea of the combination of the thesis and the antithesis into a synthesis that Hegel reworked into his abstract negative concrete, where the abstract represents the theoretical concept, the approximation of perfection. Practical idea is what happens when you try to put those ideas into practice and things go all kinds of wrong, and thus you can work out a concrete synthesis of a concrete understanding of what's actually going on in the world by combining the abstract with its practical negative, and that concrete understanding enables you to take the next turn of praxis that creates the next uh, generation of society heading toward that perfection. Marx tooled this into dialectical materialism, which is that this actually plays out through both sociological and material uh, uh, materialism. Uh, Material wasn't the right word. Metaphysical. So Metaphysical materialism is that there's no spiritual realm, that everything is physically material. So Marx was that, along with, I've heard that it's pronounced Feuerbach, his uh, kind of young Hegelian mentor. But then um, I've always pronounced it Feuerbach, but maybe I've been wrong. I can't do German, so leave it be. (laughs) Let my pronunciations die. That's fine. Um, But... uh, sociological materialism is what Marx is actually kind of most famous for, is that the material conditions that one finds oneself in in society are what are deterministic on your uh, person and your character. In other words, what Marx termed the inversion of praxis as a uh, result of the uh, sociological materialism that he was forwarding by saying that Feuerbach didn't go far enough um, with his materialism that he stopped halfway. And he creates this all-encompassing theology called dialectical materialism that is supposed to play this out. So anyway, this is the true birth of what I call dialectical leftism, which is the achieving of leftist political aims through the dialectical method, which backs into Hegel, particularly uh, as Marx and and, uh, Engels remarked that um, Hegel was the first person to distill the dialectic into a form that was almost usable. And Marx is the one who actually made it practicable by coming up with dialectical materialism. Okay, so that was a long diversion just to kind of discuss terminology. But the broad religion in which all of the left has been playing out for at least 150, but probably 200 years, is what I would call maybe 250 years preceding the French Revolution, in fact, too, is dialectical leftism, which is the attempt to achieve leftist political aims through dialectical methods. Okay, so when we talk about communists, we talk about Marxists, we talk about neo-Marxists, we talk about critical Marxists, we talk about woke Marxists, whatever in between. We talk even about Hegelians, young or old, we're still talking about dialectical leftists. I know you're going to say, wait, 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 James, that goes way too far. The old Hegelians were conservatives. No, they were their day's neocons um, who are still caught up in the dialectical system, and they're still, as we see today, working toward somewhat leftist aims. They believe that they can transform the world into what it's supposed to be. That's the leftist aim to transform the world. However, they believe that we have the right system, and we're going to spread that around the world and then make it sustainable. What a funny buzzword there, just to kind of throw some around. So anyway, I will mention quite a lot about the dialectical left or the communists. I'm just kind of like using different terms because none of these quite stick and I need something. Dialectical left is too academic, I confess. But they are the people who are in charge of the essence of critique. And that's where we have to dive in and talk about what critique is. So the method of the dialectical left is critique or criticism or critical theory which is, in a sense, a form of social alchemy. And I mean that quite literally. I've already done lots of discussions on how this actually is rooted in the concept, the whole dialectical process is rooted in the concept of hermetic alchemy, um, how you use the negative critiquing frame to try to destroy the mundane form that 
entraps the divine form contained within it to release that, how that is a trend that is visible through Hegel, through Marx, um, through Marcusa unambiguously, through Ferreri uh, unambiguously, and <clears throat> that this framework is, uh, what, what it boils down to is that the good, the ideal society or the ideal circumstance the communism is the true nature of man, whatever you want. The divine form is hidden within that which we have in the mundane form. Our theoretical idea is the approximation of the absolute idea, but the absolute idea is contained crudely within the practical idea. And if we were to just break open that by seeing the contradictions between them, then we can improve the theoretical idea, move it closer to the absolute. But in fact, what we could do is free the absolute entirely from its mundane confines and achieve the end of history or the end of the world, the eschaton, uh, the arrival of the kingdom of God here on earth built by man for man in accordance with man so that it is making the world and man suitable for that world. This is the whole program. Okay, that was way more than I wanted to say. Critique is the method, though. A ruthless criticism marks out of all that exists. And it's a special kind of criticism. It's a difference between critical thinking, which is skepticism, question, seeking soundness and validity to your argument, uh, hypothesis testing, using evidence to try to discredit bogus theories and so on. That's critical thinking. Critical theory is different. Critical theory uses criticism in a particular way, which I want to just make the case. And this is the whole point of all that preamble. Critical theory exists to play a word game. It, in fact, exists to redefine words so that the words are to be understood in terms of the structural power dynamics that it believes shape and constrain reality. If you remember your marks, those material conditions through the inversion of praxis condition man. And so the activism, the praxis that Marx advocates is that you're going to go engage in activity that is going to change society a little bit so that he's conditioned a little bit differently. Marcuse frames this as creating a biological foundation for socialism. The inversion of pra so praxis is that you go out and change the world and the inversion of praxis is that the world in turn changes you. That's called social conditioning and the social constructions of the world are, in fact, the deterministic features. For Marx, those were material conditions were socially constructed through the interplay of the upper class and the lower class, the base and the superstructure upon, uh, or from which grows out of it, that is the, it creates the ideologies that justify its existence, etc., that condition people to accept their lot. And so that base superstructure interaction structure society, the structure of society determines your character. Marx's framing is material determinism, the kind of fully kind of linguistic cultural framing is what's called structural determinism, and entities like critical race theory use a combination of material and structural determinism. You can hear that when they start talking about the pervasion or pervasiveness of racism and microaggressions and whatever. This is structurally determined. Um, impacts upon racial minorities, uh, as they call them, racially mi minoritized groups, I should say, people of color. Uh, but at the same time, they also say that growing, they, they'll switch frames and talk about, say, white flight and um, the material conditions of poverty that correlate strongly with skin color. And so then they are talking about material determinism as well as structural determinism at the same time. So what critique does to go back to the point, what critique exists to do is to go take some concept or term and redefine it from its actual definition into one that reifies the concepts of the power dynamics that Marx, Marx's theory believes pervade and define and condition all of reality. So take any term that you want. It doesn't matter what that term is, diversity, inclusion, whatever you want. The goal of critique is to say that, hey, technically we've all been using that word wrongly because we haven't been using it in a way that accounts explicitly and intentionally for the power dynamics that Marxist theory believes condition all of reality. Nobody else believes that the power dynamics condition all of reality the way that Marxists do. 
but the broad dialectical left or Marxist framing, whichever one you want to call it, the dialectical leftist framing is that the power dynamics actually structure reality in a particular way. And as such, the concepts have to be redefined so that they are understood in terms of how reality is actually structurally understood as opposed to it being actually just understood or described or whatever else. So the point of critical theory, the point of critique, is to redefine words. That's the overwhelming purpose of it. It is, of course, to sow discontent and make people grouchy and everything else and to gain power, of course. But at kind of the higher level, its whole point is to redefine words. They want to reframe the meanings of key operative words so that those terms will be understood in terms of alleged exclusionary power dynamics that benefit some class of people and oppress another class of people across a stratifying axis of power. These power dynamics, all the critical Marxists and their descendants, and even really their predecessors in the dialectical left, all believe structure every aspect of society, including, when we get to the critical Marxists, the way that things are thought about and talked about. And critique is meant to reframe that onto their playing field, onto their turf. It's to make it so that every word you use immediately gives in to the leftist view. So let's do a couple of examples. A big important one is the term justice, which is not one of the three that I say is key to restructuring and subverting society, although it is actually a huge deal. The concept of justice is at the center of our legal system, and so if we redefine justice, we're in big trouble. But I think it follows from the others. But we hear a ton about critical Marxists because they say that they're pursuing social justice. And as I've argued in the past multiple times, social justice is a rebranding in kind of woke Marxist lingo for communism. It follows from a state of equity, which is in parallel to socialism. Socialism is an administered state that redistributes shares so that citizens or groups are made equal. Equity is an administered state so that it redistributes shares so that citizens or groups are made equals. That's the same damn thing. The exact same damn thing. The Marxist belief is that if you enforce socialism long enough and you get people to become socialists truly in their being, to awaken to their species being, as Marx phrased it, to understand that they are truly social beings through the imposition of the values of socialism through imposing the socialist state upon them. State, if we're going to talk about this in terms of, say, Gnosticism, which it's also a Gnostic religion, that the state is a demiurge that creates society, but also constrains society. But anyway, that's beside the point. Social justice is the uh, is what you get when social equity becomes spontaneous in the same way that communism is what you get when socialism becomes spontaneous and thus no longer needs to be administered because it just happens. So you no longer need a state. The state will wither away, Marx said. You don't need a state to administer socialism. Socialism is just what you get when you enter into true communism, which is the true transcendence of the concept of private property and thus the undoing from Karl Marx of the fall of man. Well, we're talking about justice and critique. So we're going to go do a critique of the concept of justice. What we're going to do is we're going to shift it away from a perspective of individuals finding fair treatment under the law in an impartial way to a new perspective where fairness in light of the power dynamics has to be taken into account. In fact, the beginning of the critique of justice, or just go look, for example, at the beginning of critical race theory to see what it says, which is which arose first in the law. The critique of justice is, in fact, begins with, I should say, in fact, the belief that the law is not impartial and, in fact, cannot be impartial. It is structured by the working of society so that it is not impartial, that it benefits certain groups over others. Critical race theory holds that it benefits people who have access to whiteness, which includes automatically white people, but it may also include Asians or light-skinned Hispanics or lots of other things. So they believe that the law is structured and thus not impartial. So now we have a new view of fairness that has to favor certain groups to account for the structuring of the law. 
So fairness isn't possible under impartial law because the law is structured to favor certain groups and disfavor others. So now we have to explicitly and intentionally reverse that uh, system. We have to understand justice not in terms of impartiality, to find fairness through impartiality, but rather to find a improved sense or a sublated or an alf gehoben sense of fairness that takes into account the power dynamics of structure society, whether through race, sex, gender, sexuality, economic class status, cultural status, or whatever else. Okay? So as a result of this critique that we're not understanding justice correctly because we're neglecting to take into account the fact that law is already structured, law and its application will have to be tilted in favor of groups that are identified through the theory and praxis to be structurally disadvantaged by the existing system. Now we're using historical marginalization now because that advantages the people pushing the agenda today, but that won't always be the case, at which point no one will care about historical marginalization any longer. As soon as that becomes uh, useless, there will be different groups because the goal isn't to empower historically marginalized groups. It is to empower leftists. But the goal is therefore to tilt the law in favor of those groups that the left believes it can use to achieve its aims. So a new understanding, a critiqued understanding of justice that allows the true nature of justice to blossom from the mundane form that it's contained within, the individualistic form that it's trapped within, follows from uh, an underlying but hidden assumption for a need for partiality that levels the playing field of the structure of law if we don't do this. So you see how they've now redefined justice to be understood in terms of power dynamics. And when justice is redefined in terms of power dynamics, we don't have justice until we are accounting for all of the injustices that occur through power dynamics. And so what we have to do is find ways to intentionally identify those and tilt the law, so long, no longer impartial, but explicitly partial to correct for those wrongs that are built into the system, which by virtue of not being fully realized communism is unjust in myriad ways, and in particular toward who? Dialectical leftists who are using this as a power grab. So when Ibram Kendi on the 19th page of How to Be an Anti-Racist very famously said that the only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination, and the only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination, where everybody can see very plainly he's advocating for a very partial, partial form of discrimination, obviously, as the remedy to the problem of society being structured by racism. What they may not have caught on is that because Ibram Kendi is not a smart man, Jenna, uh, what they may not have caught on to is that what Ibram Kendi is actually doing is a full-blown critical critique of the concept of justice. And he's saying that justice is not possible without re-understanding justice, without reframing justice in terms of power dynamics. And when you understand power dynamics such as racism, and his answer to that is anti-racism, uh, which is resisting those power dynamics and challenging them in every way and tilting the playing field accordingly to do so. When you understand justice in terms of the racist power dynamics, he says that contour society, then you understand that you have to be discriminatory and thus partial, not impartial in the law. So the concept of meeting out justice remains intact. And the concept that justice has something to do with meeting out Fairness remains intact, but impartiality under the law has to be replaced by intentional partiality under the law, intentional discrimination under the law, so that the people that the Marxist theory claims are structurally disadvantaged, meaning themselves or their proxies, are given additional privileges relative to everybody else. So what the critique of the concept of justice achieves by diving into the concept of justice and saying it doesn't take into account the hidden power dynamics, the hidden assumptions contained within what we think individual-based, individual rights-based justice would actually be, by diving into that critique, you're able to free up the idea that we need partial justice that will be administered in an equitable way until it becomes spontaneous, at which point we'll have actual justice. And justice becomes a power dynamical concept that now means communism, because all the words mean communism. I could save us a lot of time on the social justice encyclopedia I was writing by just saying that every word means communism. So another example we spent a lot of time here going through on the podcast is education. 
education. This is Paulo Freire. This is all he did. This is all the guy did. Remember, they're trying to solve the problem of reproduction and all of this, how the educational system is built out of the existing society in order to educate people to succeed in the existing society. So by definition, it reproduces the existing society. That's the problem of reproduction, which is only a problem if you're a freaking Marxist. Well, they are. So they had to do a critique of education. That's what critical pedagogy exists to do, or at least on the the self-reflective side of it. So the concept of education has to be understood, and this is what Paulo Freire did, and then redesigned according to the same paradigm. By the way, so does everything else in society. Critical Marxism believes that the very terms of society itself are corrupt and structurally unjust, and thus must be retooled to move the marginalized from the margins to the center, and vice versa, so that which is centered needs to be decentered. The tool that they use to do that is that they critique concepts that create the current society. They redefine them. And in the case of education, education is criticized for being an unjust credentialing mechanism that allows for those who accept the unjust and corrupt terms of society uh, to move into a, to, to positions of power and authority by claiming, well, I'm educated. I got the credentials necessary to get here from which they can then ensure the society will reproduce itself, thus creating the problem of reproduction. So when we critique education, we say, "Uh uh-huh, well, education is not actually an education. It is grooming into the existing system. It is, in fact, a form of brainwashing into the existing system. And nobody even realizes it. So why? Because it reproduces the existing status quo and the logic of the status quo, and the hierarchy of the status quo, all the way down to the fact of the teacher having power over the students, in, it, it socializes, so socially indoctrinates, or structurally conditions the students to believe that there should be this hierarchical power dynamic. So Paulo Freire comes and says, no, 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 that's a banking model of education. We're going to use a dialogical model where the students and the, the teachers are going to be as equals. There'll be student teachers and teacher students who learn from another, one another. And we're going to look at the what what's being produced by this education system. In fact, we're going to get away with student and te- from student to teacher entirely and go into educator who is a facilitator and a learner. And then the subjects of learning are going to become mediators for a different kind of knowledge that genuine education is going to be about. And so what they do when they critique this is they say, well, what we're doing in education is we have this secret hidden curriculum. We're teaching people how to be citizens in the existing society, how to want to succeed, how to behave, how to endorse the existing society. That's a hidden curriculum while we try to teach them the explicit curriculum of mathematics, reading, writing, science, history, and so on. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to flip that upside down. We're going to explicitly teach them a political education that brings to light the real or the concrete conditions of their lives. And in so doing, we will allow the math and the reading and the writing and the history and the science to become the hidden curriculum. Because those are mere mediators to political knowledge. And people who become politically activated, who realize that they say have to have statistical skill in order to do their activism will want to learn statistics on their own part and will go learn it in order to be able to be activists with it. So a genuine education, once critiqued, because education is imparting the power dynamics, has to be inverted so that it becomes a political education that teaches people to understand society through critique and then to reject it, of course, and become activists or change agents to transform it into something different. So at present, the prevailing idea of education is actually miseducation, and real education can be had only by people who understand the inherent political nature of education. Teaching is a political act. You've heard this before. And so, speaking of miseducation, we've been miseducating our kids with this garbage for about 30 years now across all of North America, especially the United States. But in these two cases, I think you can see what I'm talking about. There's a subtle shifting of the meaning of the term in question, and that arises from the critique of that concept. We're going to critique justice until justice is redefined in terms of power dynamics. We're going to critique education until what education is becomes political education because it's been redefined in terms of answering the power dynamics of society. And in fact, with Freire and the critical Marxists, that he, he, was, he was a critical Marxist, um, 
we're actually believing that the very terms of society are corrupt. And so that's why Ferrari's model is to learn to see dehumanizing forms everywhere and to denounce them everywhere in a way, everywhere you find them in a way that announces the possibility of a better world, which by the way, transforms the nature of Marxist activism into kind of a know nothing project. Uh, and that'll be a subject of a future podcast, I think. Um, that I think is very important to understand exactly what gift Freire gave to the Marxist side of the aisle, which is the capacity to have armies of completely idiotic, illiterate activists who know how to do the key thing, even if they have no idea what they're doing or why they're doing it, which answers a ton of questions about why people are saying it's Marxism. And then you ask anybody that's participating in it and they say, well, I don't know anything about Marx. I don't know anything about Marxism. I've never read a page of Freire. I've never read a page of Marx or Marcuse. I've never heard of these people, but somehow they're activists for a Marxist cause. It's very easy to understand when you understand what Paulo Freire brought to the table, what he actually gave to these activists. But anyway, the point of critique is to take a concept and to redefine it in terms of the power dynamics based understanding so that it redefines it in a way that gives the communist or dialectical left the advantage. They are framing everything onto their own playing field. Discrimination gets reframed, justice gets reframed, fairness gets reframed, education gets reframed, the law gets reframed. All of these different concepts get reframed so that when you try to argue or de debate them or even get engaged with them in, a, say, a court, that level of confusion naturally and automatically advantages them. Okay. So this is the process of how they subvert words, institutions, and thus even society itself, because it turns out that using language is how we build society through laws, through cooperation, through communication, through planning. And if they can subvert the meaning of the terms, they can subvert the meanings of policies, they can subvert the meanings of laws, they can subvert the meanings of constitutionally guaranteed rights. All they have to do is change the meanings of the words so that the words are understood in the power dynamical frame. And what I'm saying is that critical theory exists. The critique inside of critical theory exists to redefine words in terms of the way that theory needs to misunderstand them so that the left gets the political advantage. So there are three key terms that are doing this. We did, we just talked about education and we talked about justice that are kind of big deals, but there are three key terms that build on one another that really give them the ability to subvert society and to transform it into something wholly under their control. And like I said, these three terms are inclusion, democracy, and citizenship. And you can hear them when we get time to get to that last one you know, that we're talking about something big. You might hesitate on democracy. Obviously, that one's big too, but you might hesitate on democracy because you think, well, we live in a republic. Who cares? Uh, well, you'll see. So inclusion is actually the easiest of these words to understand, and I've spent a ton of time talking about it, but um, it, it's probably the foundation of, of, of a lot of the words that are being misused strat strategically by woke Marxists and their agendas today. Um, the dialectical left has defined inclusion to mean including their operatives and excluding people who are not their operatives or their operatives don't like. Um, so few words are actually more important than this because this is the mechanism. And I'll just point out, by the way, you know, I like to bring up the World Economic Forum. I can bring up the United Nations. I love to bring up these huge entities. We could talk about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative or the Rockefeller Foundation or lots of these big foundations. But the World Economic Forum and the United Nations are explicit again and again and again and again. They say that their goal is to transform the world into a more sustainable and inclusive future. So the subversion of the term inclusion is the subversion that they're relying upon in order to order the world for their favor. So their idea is that there are these Marxist theories like identity Marxism or woke Marxism that is the S and ESG that they love so much. And there are people that those theories, identity Marxist theories say have been excluded and thus must be actively included when we understand inclusion through the power dynamic. And that means that including them, these are going to be your leftist commissars and excluding everybody else in order to create a sense of inclusion and belonging. And that's going to uh, limit occupancy. It's going to um, achieve all of the goals of entryism of getting people, their people into positions of power and purging people 
uh, that they don't want out of positions of power. It also justifies censorship, like on Twitter, uh, and the purges of people like various firings or throwing people off of Twitter, for example. So to woke Marxists, let's understand inclusion. Inclusion expresses the idea that nobody is excluded by virtue, is that nobody should be excluded by virtue of the unjust power dynamics that woke Marxism describes as a theory. So let me make that clear. It's not about whether or not people are inc- excluded. It's about if power dynamics are excluding them or the perception of power dynamics. In other words, if you find somebody who has been conditioned to think about the world in a Marxist, woke Marxist way, a critical race way, a gender theory way, a queer theory way, fat studies way, and they feel like there's a possibility that they or somebody that is in their their view uh, of their, their theory if the, the, there's a possibility that somebody might be or feel excluded or not fully in- included, then you have a problem that has to be fixed. So inclusion means that nobody is excluded by virtue of the fact that there are unjust power dynamics. But those are the unjust power dynamics they believe structure the world that other people can't see because they haven't been brainwashed to see them, which they believe is a form of willful ignorance as opposed to literally them being in a cult. You're willfully ignorant, you see, if you aren't in the cult with them. So for woke Marxists, free societies with impartial laws, like we just discussed, don't address the underlying structural power dynamics. Those power dynamics create de facto exclusion. There doesn't have to be a a discrimination issue. Maybe, for example, we see this on some college campuses, or we have seen, and black people just feel uncomfortable around the white gaze. So they don't want a single white person, and they want wholly black spaces set aside for themselves. Because the presence of a white person reminds them of white supremacy, they say, structural white supremacy. It doesn't matter if that person's ever doing anything racist at all. Their mere presence reminds them that there are no spaces specifically for them, whereas every space affords white people the possibility of feeling like it is explicitly for them. And so this de facto, the the presence of a white person creates de facto exclusion of black people. So we have to intentionally, in the name of inclusion, exclude white people, or a giant rock that I've mentioned a bunch of times because it's so preposterous on the campus of the University of Wisconsin at Madison, which was associated with a racial slur from over 100 years ago and therefore became non-inclusive because it might make somebody feel um, excluded from full participation in campus life. So racial and sexual minorities really meaning woke activists within those groups could be made to feel excluded. Woke Marxists would, would, would insist by virtue of a belief that say straight white men are the defaults in many positions of power and authority. That's kind of what we're seeing with boardrooms. This is why we're seeing policies that raise your ESG score under the governance, by the way, metric, uh, that require you to have racial minorities, sexual minorities, and or women on your corporate boards. Because straight white men are, according to woke Marxism, defaults in society, advantaged by society. And when we re-understand the idea of inclusion in terms of power dynamics, it's not that the board is inclusive and that anybody who's qualified can make it onto the board. It's that the board is not inclusive because the default assumption is that it's going to be straight white men. And therefore, other people feel excluded or are excluded, stereotype threat or whatever other justifications that they use to, to create this. And so therefore, we have to create policies that tilt things the other way. You have to have a corporate board if you want a good ESG score, including a woman, a sexual minority, a racial minority, and some kind of a canned joke about them walking into a bar together. And the bartender saying something about the benefits of diversity because in uh, post-comedy or post-humor, we don't make jokes. We make lectures that are set up like jokes. So women, for example, are often considered to be excluded from full participation in society because they end up as a matter of circumstance, because they can end up being mothers. The demands of motherhood are high. Women can get pregnant. Somebody could get them pregnant and they didn't even mean to. They didn't plan for it. They didn't intend to. They've now been thrust into pregnancy and motherhood, which takes away from their ability to fully participate in society. And that quickly and neatly explains most of their views about abortion, so-called rights, and the recently published notion in the New York Times that maternal instinct is a myth created by men. Uh, So in Marxist terms, there's an oppressive ideological narrative that supports structural 
patriarchy that exists because women can become pregnant, whereas men cannot, and therefore um, women are excluded from many of the opportunities of society by virtue of their biology. And by the way, they didn't ask to be born in that body or as they believe it, have that sex assigned to them at birth. They didn't ask for that. So there's a power dynamic built into the very structure of reality that disadvantages women. So an inclusive system is going to have to work intentionally to tilt the playing field to include women uh, on purpose by often explicitly excluding or implicitly excluding men. And this applies across the suite. So inclusion becomes exclusion by virtue of saying that we have to include people who we believe are being excluded by virtue of the power dynamics that they believe structure society. So when you do the critique of the concept of inclusion, this is what you end up with. And the word inclusion gets subverted. Inclusion means including leftists to the exclusion of others, especially right-wingers, by this little simple magic trick, this linguistic trick, which is the critique of the concept of inclusion. Now, on the back of the concept of inclusion, we have the concept of democracy. Democracy is ruled by the people, which is all the people, right? Not some of the people, all of the people. And communists have seized upon this idea to redefine democracy in terms of inclusion or in terms of by critiquing it and uh, use that redefinition to stoke resentment about the supposed structural disenfranchisement uh, in our society. And they've been doing this for over a century. Um, why do you, the leftists always talk about, or the Democrats say, our democracy is a threat, our democracy is a threat, our democracy is a threat? Well, they know that the word has a positive valence with people. They think we live in a democracy. By the way, we don't. We live in a republic. America's founding fathers had the good sense to realize that democracies were terrible ideas, just like the Greeks knew. Partly, though, they also had the privilege, while writing the Constitution, of having many of the influential members either visiting or living in Paris. Thomas Jefferson lived in Paris while the Constitution was being written. He corresponded regularly with John Madison, James Madison, sorry, um, James Madison, uh, and he, he, he corresponded regularly with, with Madison, and they were watching the attempt of a democratic revolution. They just had the American Revolution, now the French Revolution is playing out. The American, Revolu the American Revolution created this new confederacy of, of, of states. They're trying to figure out what they were going to do with it. Um, you know, their Articles of Confederation, and they, they had not written a constitution that defined the United States of America yet. But over here in France, they're screaming for democracy, and they're putting people through the terrors. They're murdering everybody. Uh, it's a huge disaster. The idea of a democratic rule horrified and terrified the American founders at the crucial moment. So they, as Benjamin Franklin famously remarked, gave us a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Well, Marxists have been sure to make sure that we all believe that we live in a democracy and that democracy is something that has to be subject to the concept of Critique. You'll notice, though, that they name all of their states that they take over republics because they're just liars. The USSR, the R was republic, right? Soviet Socialist Republic, right? Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR. What do we have in China? People's Republic of China. What do we have in North Korea? The Democratic uh, what is it, the, the Democratic Republic of Korea or something like that. People's Democratic Republic of pa Korea. I've got to get the letters in the right order. Um, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, whatever it is. It's always, they call it a republic. They're not. Um, but that's also, they're not democracies anymore. But I'm off track. I'm rambling. I want to tell you about these, the, the critiques of democracy. So, they can make people believe we live in a democracy because we live in a democratic republic. If you don't know, the earliest part, the earliest political party in the United States was the Democratic Republican Party. Not Democrat, not Republican, Democratic Republican. So we had a period where there were no real political parties. Sometimes this is called the Federalist Era, where we were, the, the battle was between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, the Federalists won. We wrote a Federalist Constitution. And so kind of everybody was on the same political party, which was in a sense the Federalist 
uh, party, though there wasn't really a party at all because there was just one. And then the Democratic Republican Party comes out of this and people started to run on the Democratic Republican ticket. And um, what does that mean? It means that we're in a republic that's run through Democratic voting. So we're in a particular kind of republic where our representatives, that's republic, are elected democratically. That's Democratic Republic. Just to break down some basic civics here. So 1917, though, in a, a, a book called The State and Revolution, Vladimir Lenin gave a robust critique, and as far as these things are ever robust, critique of democracy in capitalist societies. In fact, what he said is that within capitalist societies, there is no true democracy. There is only bourgeois democracy. There is rule by the empowered minority in the bourgeoisie through what appear to be democratic means. But the problem is that lots of people are excluded from having enough political power or suffrage to be able to actually be full participants in their democracy. So you don't actually have democracy. The rich people have more capacity to say, you know, pull favors, get op-eds written to tell stories, to to rent out a facility and have have, have a, a stage that they can, you know, reach thousands of people from or whatever it happens to be. The poor are excluded. If they're uneducated, nobody wants to hear from them. Racial minorities, etc., might be excluded entirely. Women in 1917 were still excluded in the United States from suffrage. And so, as he described it in his own words, democracy was bourgeois. It was democracy, to quote him, democracy for an insignificant minority, democracy for the rich, that is, the democracy of capitalist society. And he described it this way. In capitalist society, this is quoting Lenin from chapter 5 of The State and Society, in capitalist society we have a democracy that is curtailed, wretched, false, a democracy only for the rich, for the minority. The dictatorship of the proletariat, the period of transition to communism, will for the first time create democracy for the people, for the majority, along with the necessary suppression of the exploiters of the minority. Okay, so let me pause before we finish the quotation. That's Lenin's democratic socialism. Okay, and well, how does he describe it? First of all, it's a dictatorship. It won't be the first democracy for the people, for the majority. And then he adds in, along with the necessary suppression of the exploiters of the minority. So his idea of a first real democracy for the people will be A, a dictatorship, and B, that it will apparently promote the so-called people through the dictatorship while also suppressing the people that the state doesn't like. So it literally disenfranchises people. Why? Because the existing democracy has a power dynamic where those people are the only people who have actual political enfranchisement. And so we're going to disenfranchise them and enfranchise other people. The minor, uh, the, the what he calls the people, the majority, which of course will be represented in the um, Soviet Republic by the Soviet Party or the Communist Party. Um, and the Soviet Council is technically what the Soviet was. He says, communism alone is capable of providing really complete democracy. And the more complete it is, the sooner it will become unnecessary and wither away of its own accord. And so why is communism uniquely capable of providing complete democracy or true democracy or ideal democracy, as it got called various times in various places. And it's because unless everybody's actually fundamentally fully equal in every level, which is only achievable in true communism, there is no equality. Thus, the Democrat, the, 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 the demos, I should say, the people are not equal. And if they're not equal, they're not equally enfranchised under the political system, and if they're not equally enfranchised under the political system, you don't have true democracy, you have bourgeois democracy. So Lenin, using critique, explained that the democratic voting system in a capitalist society is not truly democratic because it only serves a bourgeois minority. Democracy can only be genuine when everybody is really equal, which can only occur under communism. But in the meantime, under socialist rule in the USSR under the dictatorship of the proletariat, there will be a simulation of true democracy that allegedly elevates the people and suppresses the bourgeois exploiters. Mm -hmm. 
in modern parlance, and I promise I'm not going to say we're going to suppress deplorables, except that I technically just said it, what Lenin is describing would be, and in fact is, called inclusive democracy. It is inclusive of the people who are excluded by the weird definition of inclusion. That's why it's key to understand that they subverted the definition of inclusion, because we need to have an inclusive democracy. That's a real term that they use, and it uses the exact same trick on the definition of inclusion to achieve its aims, but it ties it to the word democracy so that a truer, a truer, that was clumsy, a more true democracy is Appro approached or approximated by being inclusive in democracy. In other words, by intentionally using the concept of a critiqued inclusion to tilt the playing field to the advantage of the people that the theory says are excluded, which means leftist political operatives. So we're not going to have a truly inclusive democracy until we include more leftists and exclude more right-wingers, which should sound to you very familiar of Herbert Marcuse's idea of liberating tolerance, as he described it in the book or the, the essay Repressive Tolerance. So the underlying belief is that the society is exploitative of certain groups who are probably in the majority, like, say, straight white men, and thus those people aren't equal participants in the democratic process. And I said that backwards. It's exploitative of people who are in the majority, like people of color, women, etc. A minority, like straight white men, are the ones that are, are empowered by it. And so the people who are excluded are not equal participants by structural power, are not equal participants in the democratic process. Only really the people who are structurally advantaged or privileged are full participants. Everybody else is kind of excluded or is diminished participant, and they have to be made equal, which is equity. The, the adjustment of enfr uh, enfranchisement, opportunity, and privilege is equity. The term in Lenin's day, of course, was democratic socialism, as I said. So what they did was they created a Soviet republic, and they um, pretended that they were being democratic within the party, but outside of the party, there was no democracy, and if you were part of the people, you were probably not going to be enfranchised in any way whatsoever. And again, when we hear major players in politics and media today say that open discussion threatens to create misinformation, that's a big thing today, right? That threatens our democracy. This is really kind of what they're talking about, that they want an inclusive democracy and that they are in control of. They view their democracy, like the one that they own, as the only legitimate democracy, and that's only legitimate when it's inclusive democracy and thus one that must adjust shares, including opportunity. In other words, it must discri discriminate and suppress in order to achieve its aim. So we have to have for our democracy, say, mail-in ballots. We can't have voter ID because apparently black people don't know how to get ID, I think Joe Biden said. They don't know how to use computers. They don't know what a Xerox machine is, I think Kamala Harris said that or somebody. Because obviously black people don't know how to participate in society as adults without paternalistic Democrats to tell them how. Um, they have to create all these obvious loopholes in our voting systems that massively advantage Democrats or can be taken advantage of by illegally participating Democratic Party activists and actors in order to have an inclusive democracy. Which you can see doesn't actually help, say, black people or gay people. It actually just puts Democrats in power who are using those people and typically screwing them over. Look how great life in all these cities are, all these predominantly black and Hispanic neighborhoods. Look how wonderful things are unfolding for uh, the, the, the gay community now that they're being associated with strippers and drag queens and grooming and uh, degeneracy of every kind and fetish and everything else. There's no such thing as possibly just living your life as a gay person and getting along. No, it's got to be this full tilt thing. But of course, that's the evil right wing that's mentioning that this is happening. That's the problem. And they have to be further excluded. And it really, it's because like Lenin pointed out, it's, it's not that they want to be unfair. It's that they have to be this way in order to get their way so that their evils can eventually wither away of their own accord when they're no longer needed anymore, which is when communist, communism arrives. And as we've discussed before, communism never arrives. It's fake. It's just a marketing pitch to give these people power, to give leftists power. It's never going to come. In fact, if we were doing the Fourier analysis podcast, we would say that no matter which stage you're in, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what year, doesn't matter which country, doesn't matter which attempt, doesn't matter North Korea, Soviet Union, 
um, uh, China, CCP, doesn't matter, Cuba, pick Venezuela, pick your favorite one, doesn't matter. Literally none of them are any closer to communism than the United States in 1950. None of them are. There's no closer to communism. You never get there. There's no closer. There's no closer to never getting there. Just like there's no closer to infinity. Pick any number you want. All There's infinity numbers between that number and infinity. There's only, say, a trillion numbers between one trillion and one. There's infinity numbers from a trillion up to infinity. You never get close. You don't even not get to infinity. You never get closer to infinity. Same thing with communism, because communism is a limit. You never actually get to communism. You just get to new forms of socialism that suck in more important ways. But that, I digress. So this third term, then, we've, we've got inclusion that's been redefined, and then they redefine democracy, and then they in the modern world, they've retooled it in terms of an inclusive democracy. The thing that operates that's being included and enfranchised to participate in the inclusive democracy is a citizen. So they're retooling citizenship. And so it will surprise you 0% at this point to understand that they did the exact same critique to citizenship, which means they redefined the word citizenship so that the real understanding, according to them, that we all have to use for what it means to be a citizen is, in fact, an inclusive citizen or inclusive citizenship. Citizenship usually denotes the relationship of persons recognized as citizens that they have with the state. Okay? That's it. So there's relationship people have with their state, and citizenship denotes that relationship. Uh, in republics like the United States, this relationship is that the state borrows political authority from pe- from the people temporarily, in exchange, and in exchange for that authority, the state is to use it only to secure their inalienable rights <laughs> among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which they tend to forget. Now, of course, Thomas Jefferson believed that those followed from John Locke's expression that, that one of the inalienable rights is your right to property, which is exactly the point where Karl Marx said the fall of man occurs and he flipped out. Communists, in other words, do not like the right to private property. Karl Marx wrote in the Communist Manifesto, chapter two, if you need to go look it up, that communism can be summarized in a single sentence, the abolition of private property. So for woke Marxists or dialectical leftists, whatever you want, citizenship is the other side of the coin of democracy. Citizens in a country like ours are the people enfranchised and empowered to participate in their democracy, or their democratic republic, as it were. But not a Soviet republic, as it turns out, because only the council, the Soviet, has that capacity. Anyway. Therefore, A person is only a full citizen to the degree that structural power doesn't disenfranchise that person, even as a matter of kind of weird fact, right? That's the way the critique works. See, you think you're a citizen, but there's structures of power that take away some of your opportunity. Things are not fully equitable. Therefore, you don't have as much voice as a person of color or as a gay person, or you have to devote your time and energy to activism on behalf of being black or being gay. You have to do all these different things that other people don't have to do, so they are fuller citizens. They have more full access to the privileges and the, the, the benefits of society than you do. They're full citizens, but if you are on the, the, the receiving end of an unjust power dynamic, the injustice partially disenfranchises you from the, the, the society that you're a part of, and so your citizenship isn't full. So that might be through literal exclusion, like, say, back in the day, really early on when black people couldn't vote, or it might be as just a matter of fact, or when women couldn't vote, or whatever else. So um, inclusive citizenship is a Marxist model, or kind of a very late neo-Marxist model of citizenship, using this perverted idea of inclusion, in a perverted idea of a democracy to justify that citizenship has to be a tilted concept as well to account for these alleged power dynamics. So what they've done is a critique of citizenship and reframed what it means to be a citizen outside of any belief in an impartial state. So there is no impartial state. There are power dynamics everywhere. They structure society. It is structurally and materially deterministic. So you have to account for that in your definition of citizenship, which is your relationship to the state, or else you don't have an inclusive citizen being able to participate fully in an inclusive democracy. See how these go together? Of course, it believes that an impartial state is impossible, 
that it's always organized to maintain the power, privilege, and advantage of the people who are already advantaged, and thus they are uniquely morally positioned to be able to resist that by stealing that power and authority. So a key example of this issue has already been raised, and that's motherhood. Motherhood detracts for women from full citizenship, according to woke theory, by placing demands on a woman. Those demands might be to the family, to the child, to your body, depending on what you're going through. And that means to something other than direct civic participation. So when a woman becomes a mother, she loses part of her citizenship because she can't fully participate in society as a full citizen because she has duties to family and child and self that fall under the umbrella of mother. And this is a unique imposition by nature, as it turns out, upon women that is an injustice because it politically removes some of their enfranchisement in the society. So the impositions of motherhood in the theory exclude women from full citizenship and activist potential, especially if they aren't given complete authority and autonomy to decide if and when they will become or remain mothers. So they have to campaign for abortion rights, as they call them, the way that they do. The problem is that motherhood, or not even motherhood, the potential of motherhood limits their ability to live the life as a citizen as they want. Citizenship for them is usually framed as the ability to say yes to what you want to say yes to and no to what you want to say no to while fulfilling the demands of the social contract of the state in which you live. Well, mothers can't do that because sometimes they have to deal with a dirty diaper. They have to set aside time to go to the OBGYN. They have to give birth, which might cause them to be unwell or to die. They have all kinds of issues. They have all kinds of money they have to devote to the cause of raising a child. They have to be dutiful to that. They have to put the child ahead of themselves so many times, believe it or not. An inclusive citizenship would therefore demand that society reprioritize around women to increase the amount of political enfranchisement women as a class receive in order to make up for and correct this imposition while also granting them special rights and privileges that other people wouldn't get so as to make things equal since they're naturally not equal. So when you pile on top of this that they have beliefs about structural patriarchy and intentional power exclusion by power via sexism and misogyny, having to cope with sexism and misogyny, you know, cat calls and all of the stresses of being a woman, all of these things diminish a woman's full capacity to have inclusive citizenship. And these are the similar things are believed to be imposed upon racial minorities, sexual minorities, and all the other minoritized groups, poor people, as Lenin laid out, by the structural power dynamics that woke Marxism exists to identify and critique. So women need special privileges, racial minorities need special privileges, sexual minorities need special privileges. The concept there is actually literally called sexual citizenship. And as we'll discuss more in the future, it is one of the seven key principles of comprehensive sexuality education is to educate children into being full sexual citizens. There's some groomer schools for you. And on and on it goes. We have to have inclusive citizenship to answer the fact that there are power dynamics in society, like the capacity to become a mother. We have to have intentionally tilted politics, intentionally tilted opportunity, intentionally tilted enfranchisement in order to make up for the challenges of uh, disenfranchisement and, and oppression that come along with these so-called power dynamics. Um, and it answers the alleged challenge of the unfair tilting or disenfranchisement of people by offering special privileges to so-called historically marginalized or other disadvantaged groups. And then of course, what this really boils down to, because leftists or dialectical leftists and Marxists are using these groups as tools Uh, leftists among them are given power because they're the only ones with the true view. Otherwise, they have internalized misogyny or something. And suppressing other people, in particular suppressing conservatives. It's a justification for the liberating tolerance within the essay of 
uh, that, that's supposed to advantage leftists as described in the essay by Marcuse of repressive tolerance. So by redefining citizenship, leftist activists can actually subvert society entirely. Does, and that's the key. So this really, this tower of, of Babel, in a sense, was, you know, inclusion to inclusive democracy to inclusive citizenship is all about redefining these terms in terms of power dynamics, partly so that I want you to come away actually understanding how they, what critique means that they are, use, critique means redefining a word to understand it in terms of power dynamics. When at which point they've redefined the term so that it implicitly advantages leftists when it gets used, and outside of themselves and each other, because nobody else reads their writing at all, ever, nobody else knows that they've redefined the term, and they will take advantage of it in policy situations. So I want you to come away with that. But you need to understand that this tower from inclusion to inclusive democracy to inclusive uh, citizenship, which, by the way, will extend inclusive citizenship, will eventually be global citizenship because it has to be inclusive around the globe, not just within nations, but across them all. And national citizenship will, in fact, be problematic. And that'll be a huge push. It's already a push, but it'll become a more and more huge push as, as time goes on, unless these people are stopped completely. And finally, for once, but by redefining citizenship, they, they, what they achieve is a tremendous ability sub, to subvert society. Because what you're now doing, if you get lots and lots and lots of people to think of themselves completely on a fundamentally different level in terms of what their agreement with their state is, they will become relentless activists on behalf of transforming the state into the thing they think that they're supposed to have, or into the relationship they think they're supposed to have or that they do have. Hence the way that they act whenever they don't get their way politically about anything. They take to the streets, they flip out, they assert that they have all these rights that don't exist. Rights to education, rights to not have to pay back student loans, um, rights to, uh, you know, have an abortion the day after birth or whatever the hell they assert at any given point. Um, they can actually fully subvert a society by entirely rewriting the social contract from within without ever rewriting the social contract terms, let's say the constitution or whatever, by getting people to fundamentally differ in their view, to change their view, to critique and reframe their view of what it actually means to be a citizen. This is what has happened since the civil rights era. Marxists have taken advantage of the situation in the civil rights acts, which I still think are a crowning achievement of, of, um, moral victory in our country. Don't get me wrong, but the leftists have been very successful at creating a very biased interpretation of the civil rights acts in terms of structural power and diversity and inclusion, depending on the domain using court cases like Griggs versus Duke power or Bakke versus the university of California board of regents or, um, Grutter versus Bollinger. They were able to actually redefine the social contract around discrimination and civil rights. And what they did was they reinterpreted it in terms of disparate impact. In other words, in terms of power dynamics, because disparate impact is taken as proof because of these Supreme court cases of some kind of discrimination and that there's an implicit benefit to diversity, meaning diversity of appearance and, and a cultural background of some kind or another. Um, that's what these court, the Supreme Court decisions actually laid down. And so what they did is they created an entirely different paradigm of civil rights law interpretation that actually laid the runway for the woke plane to take off. That is, in fact, how the woke program works legally. That's how it gets away with everything it's ever gotten away with in, in corporations. If you wonder how they're getting away with all these things, this is what they've done is they've created a situation in which citizenship, as a matter of fact, has already been redefined under civil rights legislation to be understood in a different way. And we functionally have a different republic because a large proportion of the population and virtually the entire left at this point actually thinks the social contract says something it doesn't say if we had a literal social contract in this country, which we do in a sense, which is the Constitution. In this case, the Equal Protection uh, Clause of the 14th Amendment is being violated left, right, and center by having critiqued the idea of equal protection so that it becomes equitable protection which they've done by saying that there are these power dynamics that create disparate impacts, and the disparate impacts can be treated as discrimination, and the discrimination can be prosecuted under discrimination law uh, right into the civil rights statutes. See how that works? So they fundamentally transformed what it means for many, many people to 
to understand what it means to be a citizen of this country and that you're not a full citizen in some sense if you're black, if you don't have affirmative action. You're not a full citizen if you're a woman unless you have, say, a year of maternal leave paid or whatever other thing they demand, abortions until, you know, the child's seven years old or whatever they want to do. Because it's still an imposition to be a parent, maybe, right? Where does that slope stop sliding? It's a good question. By replacing citizenship with inclusive citizenship, <laughs> stuttering all around this, you can imagine what it'll be known as global citizenship. You'll have to answer to the UN, the World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the OECD. All of these huge global freak shows are going to become the de facto government of the world. And we're going to have to define our citizenship in terms of them. Remember, there is no such thing as a global citizen because there is no global sovereign. We shouldn't want a global citizenship because we don't want to be global citizens because we don't want a global sovereign. But by replacing citizenship with inclusive citizenship, leftists have by default, and everybody who believes and thinks this way, created a new and separate social contract that inherently advantages leftism while intentionally disadvantaging everyone that opposes leftism. If it feels like we live in two countries with two sets of laws that are completely irreconcilable, irre it's because we have two large populations that have fundamentally different social contracts they operate under. And the reason that the political advantage flows the way that it does currently is because one of those is uh, the one that is actually aiming for impartiality as a virtue, and the other implicitly advantages itself. And so you have lots of people who believe the correct way to operate society is to advantage leftists out of hand and to disadvantage people that are conservative out of hand. And then most of their opposition, realizing that this kind of thing is a terrible idea, are looking to inherently have impartiality to advantage neither side. Well, you can see what happens in that case. So there are two solutions, by the way, to this problem. One is the reactionary path, which is to try to create a tilted playing field that advantages the right and disadvantages the left. And a lot of people are walking that path. And I fear that path and I discourage that path. And I know from talking to people in, that, are, that are walking that path that that's not going to change their mind at all because they are also becoming desperate. They're becoming afraid. They become zealots. And they are um, they're a huge risk. I'm terrified of, of what that could become that has created monstrosities throughout history when communist provocations or leftist provocations get too big. And we can name some of those and the, their defenders will come out of the woodwork to defend them. So I won't name them. Um, but you, any of these kind of right-wing reactionary dictatorships that stopped communists, sort of, but not really, in their countries. Um, a lot of those countries are communist or tilted back that way now, by the way. So it didn't really work, guys. The other way, though, is to win people over to the idea that impartiality is not being achieved through this disparate impact, critique-based, inclusive-based definition. They are not, in fact, creating impartiality. They're creating partiality. They're creating discriminatory uh, tolerance or dis discriminating tolerance, we could call it literally in, uh, on purpose, and to win more people over into the impartial camp, whether they identify as left-leaning or right-leaning on other issues like economics or whatever else. What's happening in the present, because they have advantaged themselves and there's not a good answer to that, is that they are creating the social democracy or advocating for the social democracy that Lenin insisted would pave the way to communism. They're just calling it inclusive democracy instead of social democracy. Hmm. And they are inclusive citizens, even if they don't know that they're inclusive citizens, because they don't have to know themselves by the terms. All they have to know is that things aren't really fair unless we give certain people advantages like affirmative action and so on. And of course, the belief is that if they get enough people to do this and we install the equitable system through inclusive citizenship and inclusive uh, democracy, that eventually true inclusion will finally arrive and we will have social justice, which means we'll have communism. So I'll wrap up. I'll tell you that Klaus Schwab, once again, my favorite character to refer to here, executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, wrote explicitly in his 2022 book, The Great Narrative for a Better Future, The Great Reset, book two, that's the title of the book, that his explicit goal is to rewrite the social contracts of our societies around the globe. And what they should change to, he writes, is something that favors two primary virtues or values, sustainability and inclusivity. 
a sustainable and inclusive future, he writes over and over and over again. We have to cooperate at a global level for a more sustainable and inclusive future. And the purpose of the great narrative is to foster this fundamental change through the great reset that creates it. That's his whole program. It's not a freaking conspiracy theory. He wrote books about it. More than one. So the point of the great narrative that he's writing this book about is to foster this fundamental change of the social contract toward inclusion as it's defined through critique in all values, at all levels of society, in every society on the planet at once, so that we can better cooperate through his World Economic Forum, as it turns out, on solving what he considers to be global existential risks and challenges. So in other words, inclusive citizenship will give way to global citizenship, and global citizenship will mean doing what the World Economic Forum tells you to do, and it will have to include an S in their ESG score that manages it because it has to be inclusive and redistributive by definition. But that's, of course, we started kind of talking about Karl Marx, what Karl Marx always envisioned with communism in the first place, that there would be no material differences, there would be no private property whatsoever that separates one person from another. The estrangement and alienation of man from himself and each other would evaporate because there's no longer what he calls this. He says true communism. This is in the Economic Philosophic Manuscripts. He says the true communism is the transcendence of private property and thus the transcendence of human self-estrangement. That's the goal. That's the goal. You will own nothing and you'll be happy. But these terms, inclusion, inclusion, democracy, and citizenship, where inclusion becomes the basis for redefining democracy and redefining citizenship, are three key terms that today's neo-communist movements are using and have redefined through critique in order to subvert society. They're kind of the three most important terms to really pay attention to and go after. So a shorter, I hope easier episode of the New Discourses podcast that I think should have been edifying. I appreciate your time and your attention, and I will catch you on the next one.